Hello everyone, Mark here, here in Thermal Expansion Part 2. In this part, I think we're just going to go through all the machines that Thermal Expansion has to offer, because there's quite a few of them actually, and some people don't realize how many machines there actually are. And the next section is moving on to item transportation, and I don't think I'll have enough time in one episode to do that. I'll just cut them up into kind of shorter episodes rather than one massive episode. So why don't we jump right into it? So the first two very standard things that a lot of people know about is the furnace being the first one. The furnace is a standard furnace just like anything. It will be using redstone flux. So I have a creative energy cell here just powering all the machines that need power just for demonstration purposes. But the redstone furnace uses um, the redstone flux to power. You can see the power bar on the side. And the three tabs that you will see on these machines are on the right side anyway. The left side are just have kind of information tabs. On the right side anyway, there is an RF. So depending on the ore that you have in here, it will show you a power usage for that ore. It'll show you how much energy it has stored, the maximum energy it can use, such and such. And if you just hover your mouse over the uh, left side power bar here, you kind of just see how much power it actually um, has currently in it, which is pretty cool. You know, you never know. Uh, the redstone control tab, these tabs, you can control how it's powered. So the ignored tab means you can have redstone power in the block or not powering the block. It doesn't matter. It'll still run fine. The low power means that if there isn't a redstone signal, it'll be powered. So if you put a lever on it and you do not have the lever turned on, it'll run. But if you give the block a redstone signal, um, then the redstone furnace will turn off. And the high power does the opposite of that. It requires a redstone signal to turn on. So the redstone furnace acts standard like that. The configuration just shows inputs and outputs. So if you click on a side, so this is top, right, left, bottom, and back. And that is if you are facing the front of the machine, which you can easily tell by the front decal art versus the other size of the machine. Blue means input. So if I set the top to blue, that means anything Anything I put in the blue slot up here, whether that's via a pipe, a chute, I don't know, anything other, anything that can put a item into it, it will go, you are allowing it to go into that blue side. And it will enter this slot on the machine. And then orange or red sometimes means output. And so that means anything that's on this side can accept output items from that furnace. Based on the machines, sometimes they will automatically, most of them automatically output their product, so you won't have to worry about that. And if you shift click in the middle, it will actually get rid of all of the um, configurations and reset it to nothing. So if I just set the redstone control to off, you can see that the redstone furnace is being powered and it is currently making ore. And one thing people don't re know about the redstone furnace is, is the more power you have in it, the faster will actually produce ore, or ingots, sorry. So if you have a smidge of power in here, it will take ages, oh, it can be dreadful to produce an ingot. But if you have it maxed out, you can see it's producing these ingots at three, four times the speed of a normal Minecraft furnace, which can be quite nice. Not, not much waiting, not much waiting time. As for the pulverizer, the pulverizer will do two things actually. It will double your ore output by taking an ore, converting it to a dust, so long as it is in the ore dictionary and the pulverizer recognizes it. Also, it will give you a small chance, well not a small chance, depending on the ore and depending on the um, depending on the dust that you extra dust that you can see, you'll receive, you will have a chance of receiving a bonus dust. So in here I have ferrous ore, and ferrous ore is required to get shiny dust. So if I do, if I turn the redstone control off, you'll see we'll go over and we'll produce two ferrous dust. And you can, for each piece of dust, you can create an ingot. So for one ore, you're creating two ingots. Just lets you double your ore output, and then you can create more things with it. So I'm going to be having this go on during the rest of the tutorial, and we'll check back later to see if it actually produced any shiny ingots. The next coming up is the sawmill, and the sawmill is a very underappreciated item, I think, and not a lot of people use it because they don't see it as valuable as it actually can be. But the sawmill, essentially, you take wood, logs, or any tree, and when you power it, 
you will actually get six planks and guaranteed sawdust. And if you look at uses for sawdust, you can actually see it is used to create florbs, which is another part of thermal expansion we'll look at later. And then you can create compressed sawdust, which you can go and create to charcoal and various other things. And for each log, as I said before, you will get six planks rather than four, which can be quite helpful. It stacks up quite quickly, as you can see, which just we only used um, 14. We already have over a stack, so it's pretty nice. This is a very important block you are going to love. It is so good. It's called the induction smelter. And the induction smelter takes two inputs and converts it into an output. And that output varies. And um, some common recipes are if you take two, or if you take, sorry, if we take this and this, so if we take a bauxite ore and a sand ore, and we'll turn the redstone control off, this is how you create. Okay. Sorry, let me, so I'll go through that one more time. If you put in an ore and then put in a sand with it, you have a chance of creating that ingot but also creating slag and slag you can use on later to occur to enhance your ore processing and then same you can use the dust plus sand to create more slag a recipe you're going to be needing to create some other thermal expansion stuff is you're going to be needing obsidian dust plus lead ingots or dust and it's going to create hardened glass and hardened glass is very nice because if you see da -da -da, oh okay well, it's used in some mine factory reloaded machines, I guess. It's also used in the big reactors. It's also used to make fluid ducts and item ducts and impulse item ducts, which you are going to need later on. Or at least, if you might not need them, but you're if you want them, you need the hardened glass. The magma crucible can be very nice and very handy in some, some ways. It basically takes a certain amount of... If you press on how to make... It takes an item, a block, and basically converts it into a liquid. So example for netherrack, you take netherrack, you put it in, and it will convert it into lava. If you want to know how to make a certain liquid, you can go into NEI and just hit the R key, and it'll eventually bring you to a magma crucible recipe that you can find how to make that certain liquid. So the recipe for netherrack has to be lavas. If I go to uses, You'll see if I scroll over far enough, induction smelter magma crucible, you can see netherrack with that much RF creates a bucket of lava. And if we turn back the redstone control, now this, as you can see, takes some, a little bit longer time. I know if you use ender pearls, you can create resonant ender, which is required for tesseract, so there you go. And if we just have it wait a bit, there we go, lava, perfect. Moving on, we have the fluid transposer. The fluid transposer does two things. It can either empty or put in. And this is by, we're talking about liquids here. So this is how you create the test rack. So you'll take the resonant ender, put it in here, and then the fluid transposer can stick it into the test rack. So there's two modes. There's empty, and then there's fill. And you want to think of it in terms of the fluid transposer. So if it is in empty mode, you're going to empty the transposer. So if we put it in, or sorry, it is in empty mode, and then we take the redstone control off, it is going to empty the transposer and give us water buckets back. And then if we put it into fill mode, think of it, it'll fill the transposer. So if we put the water buckets back in, it'll fill back up the transposer. You just have to, just have to think of it in terms of the transposer itself. Next, we'll have the glacial precipitator. Now this isn't a very useful block. There is other ways to get this, but it basically creates snowballs, snow and ice using various amounts of water. So if we want to create ice, or we'll make snowballs for fact. So we want to make snowballs, we have to put water into it, and then we'll just change the redstone control off. Boom. We have a snowball, and it used half a bucket of water for each snowball. We want to create some snow, change the redstone control off. Boom, we have some snow, and that also used half a bucket of water. We'll make some ice. And this looks like it is going to use, yep, it takes one bucket of water per ice and then two buckets of water per snow or per four snowballs. There you go. You can just get rid of those and do that. All right. Next is the igneous extruder, which is kind of the opposite of the glacial precipitator, more or less. Instead of creating kind of snowy 
water blocks, this creates stone and obsidian with lava. So the first is to create cobblestone, and cobblestone is really nice cobblestone generation because you get cobblestone at no charge. There's no water consumption, no lava consumption at all. If you want to create stone, however, there is no lava consumption. However, as you'll see here, there is water consumption. And to create obsidian, as you'll see, there it's a little bit slower, as you can see, but there is lava consumption and there is water consumption, which means you, you can create infinite cobblestone, fairly, really easy stone, because you can just pump in water for infinite, but obsidian's a little harder because you will constantly need to pump in lava as well as water. So next up, we have the aqueous accumulator, and this block is awesome. It is so good. I love it. It's so useful, even though it doesn't seem like it. It is the water pump you will one-time use, and you will love it for eternity. Basically, it doesn't even need... So, you can see it's filled up with water already. That's because if you just have the aqueous accumulator out in the middle of nothing, it will slowly and passively generate water from the air. And it, it believe me, it's a very slow rate. And I've had this world out for a little while because I've been making it and stuff, so it's filled up, but it's extremely slow. If you put it in a infinite, kind of that 4x4 four four or 2x2 two two infinite water pool or that 3x1 infinite water pool and just put it in the middle, it will suck up water and there's no input for it. It's just an output in the control tab. So there's, it will, every side it will pick up water and it doesn't consume the source block of water. So you put it in an infinite water pool and boom, you have infinite water forever and it per picks up that water pretty quickly, like it's not a slow rate. Well, and then depending on how much water you're using, you might need a couple of these. But it's a very, very cool block. Next up, we have the cyclic assembler. Now this is a little more complicated block at first it would seem, but it's really not that bad. Basically, it's the auto-crafting of thermal expansion. And although there are better mods for this, such as AE for auto-crafting, if it's only thermal expansion, you got auto-crafting. And you can kind of set up a line of these if you want to. So to do this, you'll need a blank pattern. And it gives you a little blank pattern tab. And to set a pattern, because you can see it needs a pattern here first, you take, so we'll just make an iron block. So you take, I'll take a piece of iron, and I'll put the iron block recipe in. And then if I put a um, schematic up here and then hit the check mark, you can see the schematic has now changed to nine times iron ingots. And if we hold shift for details, it doesn't really do much, but it, you can see schematic is one times block of iron. And then in the description, it's nine times iron ingots required for that. So then if we put this in here and go to the redstone control, it doesn't warrant, it automatically consumes all possible resources it can to create that item. So if we change the redstone control to off, you can see, boom, it consumed all the iron I had in this inventory space into blocks of iron. And as, as long as you keep dumping in items, or the iron, I, if I kept dumping in iron ingots, it would continue to make iron blocks instantly, so long as I had the machine turned on. Next up, we have the energetic infuser, which is the charging bench of thermal expansion. Um, so one of the things I figured out to charge is these leadstone flux capacitors, which I'll explain in a later tutorial. Just go with it for now. They need to be charged. And this is what the energetic infuser does. So if we change the redstone control to no power required, you can see that, well, the power doesn't really go down there. Now you can see the charge on the leadstone flux capacitor is going up. So then if I change this redstone control back to high, so it kind of turns the machine off, the charge isn't going up anymore. Well, Oh, frick, there's still, there's still power in it. Well, that's weird. It shouldn't... Huh. Huh. Interest. Do I take it out? Okay. That was weird. That must be... That could... That, I think that's a bug, because it shouldn't have charged it. Anyway, you get the point. The energetic infuser charges items um, for thermal expansion or any other redstone flux item, because I know there's other mods that adds adds items that require redstone flux charge. So anything that requires redstone flux, here's your little charging bench. This is the machinist workbench. It's similar to this kind of schematic grid over here. It's basically, you put a schematic in the top left corner into one of these slots, put a crafting recipe into this middle area where my mouse is, 
and then you hit this. It says no recipe now, but if there is a recipe in one of these three slots, you click to create recipe, and then you can do it manually here and create the item, or you can just take that schematic that it will give you and stick it into there. The reason I don't see this too much is because you only really use this unless you're doing kind of bigger crafting projects manually, but you only really use this to create schematics, which you can do inside this machine anyway. So that's kind of what the machinist works Ben Studge does. If you just place a schematic up here, actually, okay, let me find a schematic so I can actually do this just in case um, there's people that aren't exactly um, sure what they're needed to do. And we'll just get um, some iron ingots. We'll make some iron blocks again, iron ingot. Oops, not infinity of them. 64 of them. So we put the blank pattern here and we'll just make an iron block recipe again. And then we hit write schematic. Boom. Schematic is written and is now changed. We can stick all the iron in here and then we can just make blocks of iron just like the other machine did. Only the other machine did it automatically and required power. Whereas this one does, you do it manually. It doesn't require power. Kind of depends what you want to do. Next up, we have the autonomous activator. And this can replace you in automated jobs. Um, most automated jobs, I should probably say. So the four options are right click, left click. So that's pretty self explanatory, um, depending if you want the autonomous activator to do. So it control, it's, it's like a remote mouse. So you have your mouse on your desk that you use your player to right click, left click with. And you can use sneak functions and whatnot to place blocks or water some crops with a watering can or whatnot. So you can set the left click if you want it to do a left click or a right click. You can set it so that if you want the left click to be done as if you were sneaking or if you were not sneaking. And then this round robin item use means it'll just go around and it'll just kind of go around and do. So if I have an item here and an item here and an item here, it'll go do this one and this one, this one and go back to the start, do that one, that one, that one, back to the start and such forth. Randomly, as it says, it'll just randomly use an item from any spot. First slot only. It'll only use the first slot. And then we're back to round robin. The fourth final option is the aim level. So the aim level is set to the middle right now, which is the, right now it's, it's the air block dead center in front. You can set it high, which is the air block that is dead above my head right now. So it's kind of one and then up right there. And then aim low is the air block that this sign is currently occupying. So if I aim level, I have it right clicking, which is the button to place a block. And this can place blocks in midair. It doesn't need a backspace to place the block on. So I have it to right click, non sneaking, aim level low, and there's stone. And if I go to the enabled and um, hit the ignore, it doesn't require power either. That's a good point to note. The power cutoff happened at the energetic infuser. So the machinist workbench didn't need power. Boom. I place some stone and then if I aim high you can see it plays stone again now it won't place any stone low because there's a sign there so if I go aim low it won't be able to place it but that's how the autonomous activator works and a lot of people use this to if I type in watering can a lot of people use this to have the automated watering can but as you can see in the later updates if I aim low and take out the stone and put the watering can in <laughs> whoops the watering can now breaks, so you can't just have a passive crazy crop growing rate anymore because now the watering can breaks due to the mechanical hands are not delicate enough to use the watering can properly. Sadly, be kind of cool. That's what I was going to use it for, but turns out you can't. Oh well. And the terrain smasher does the opposite of the autonomous activator. Instead of placing blocks, it just smashes them and spits them out the back. So I grab. Oh, I'm going to need some more stone. Uh, not infinite. Shoot. All right. So if we turn the train smasher on bloop, and we place some, you can see the animation on front and we just place a stone on there. Boop. Cracks it. And I think you actually need a, yeah, we need an inventory space for it to actually dump. It won't just dump it on the ground. We actually need an inventory space for it to put the stone into. So there we go. And we just shift click and it just destroys the block in front. Now you can't have it aim low or aim high. It's just the block dead straight in front of it. And then all that stone, well now cobblestone is going into that chest. And we can just turn that off. Easy peasy. The last, but not, no, I guess now. The last block, or machine, I should say, in the thermal expansion mod pack is the nullifier. And this is instant void destruction. Never see again. Goodbye. 
your, your items are gone if you stick it in this thing. So we just go ahead and take some of this stone, and I just take half of that and put it in here. Boop! Instant disappear. It just... Oh, no, it gone. It's a garbage can, basically. An instant garbage can. So if we kind of set this to high, I can put the stone in. And even so, that's a good point to note. Even if that thing isn't set, even if this thing is set to whatnot, it will just consume every, everything. The configuration does the configuration is just an input. So you can just have an input of cobblestone, say from a quarry, going into the top here, and all the cobblestone instantly vaporized. Well, there we go. There's part two of the tutorial. I hope you kind of enjoyed and learned something new from this, and I hope you might want to use some of the other machines that Thermal Expansion has to offer. In the next part, we'll be going into the item transportation and liquid energy transportation, as well as Tesseracts, because Tesseracts are so cool. I love Tesseracts. And even with the new Tesseracts, they're a little more expensive, but are way, way better. So, look forward to that. Check back in a little bit, and I should have part three out with all the Tesseracts item, liquid energy, Transportation, tubes, filtering. I'll see you later. Bye.